Good morning. My name is Lee Taylor, and I'm going to go over a few housekeeping things before we get started this morning. Our session today is in Zoom webinar. That means that all attendees are muted and your cameras are off. We are recording the session and we will make that recording available soon. Please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen for any questions. We will have time for questions and answers at the end of the session. Please do not leave the session until the Q&A is over as that counts as part of the session content. ASL interpreters will be on screen throughout the session. You may change your view at the top portion of your screen. There's a little view button and you can click on that and change it to presenter or you can change it to gallery view. Also, we are using auto captioning this morning. If you do not see that on your screen, click on the CC button at the bottom. We know that there may be technical difficulties this morning and we appreciate your patience if we encounter any. So certificate el eligibility. The majority of the questions that I receive are about continuing education credits, so listen up. You must be in the content portion of the webinar for at least 90% of the session to be eligible for a certificate. This is the mandate by the boards. Please do not leave the webinar until the con conclusion of the whole session. That includes the Q&A. You do not have to enter your contact information in the chat as attendees and their time is tracked by Zoom. You must use the same email address to register for each of the learning series sessions. It's our way of tracking who's in the room with us, and this is imperative for um, the certificates, including certificates of attendance. In the coming weeks, not today, you will receive an email from me that will provide a link to access the session evaluation, then your certificate. You must complete the session evaluation to proceed on to the certificate. There's a screenshot to show you the landing page for the evaluations and certificates. Again, that will come in the coming weeks. And lastly, you're responsible for, for printing your own certificates. We do not mail or email any certificates. This website that you see houses several years of the of the System of Care Academy. So if you lose your certificate, you can always access that website to print another. And now let's learn about our presenter. Shelly Steiner is the Kentucky's Opioid Response Effort, also known as CORE, Prevention Implementation Specialist. She works for the Kentucky Department for Behavioral Health, Developmental and Intellectual Disabilities within the Cabinet for Health and Family Services. Previously, she was the Drug Free Communities Grant Coordinator for the Carter County Drug Free Coalition and the Pathways Regional Prevention Center. She earned her Certified Prevention Specialist Certificate in 2012 and has been working in the prevention field since 2009. She presented at the Kentucky Harm Reduction Summit, the CADCA National Leadership Forum, CADCA Mid-Year Training Institute, National Prevention Network Conference and the National Prescription Drug Abuse and Heroin yeah. Summit. She has also participated in a roundtable discussion at the White House with the President in 2018. She earned a Bachelor of Arts in Secondary Education majoring in Spanish and minoring in Speech and Communications for Moorhead State University. She worked in the public school system for 17 years, four as a Spanish teacher before coming to, into the prevention field. And now I'm going to turn it over to Shelly. So let's try this again. Thank you. I really appreciate that uh, introduction. And I hope everybody's ready for a, uh, a presentation on data. I know sometimes data gets a little uh, boring as we go through. I said, but hope I can make it a little bit more exciting and um, answer your questions, you know, as we go. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can everybody see my presentation? Are we good? Okay, thanks, Lee. All right, so today we're going to talk about data, 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 the 2021 HIP student survey results and the implications from those results. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview. Um, 
In the past, we give this the KIPP student survey in sixth, eighth, 10th, and 12th grades. And we've done it on the even numbered years, but with COVID, we had to push it back a year. And so um, in 2021, there was a total of 93,812 students that took it. So a total of 127 of the 173 public school districts plus two private schools. Uh, in 2018, it included Jefferson County, but it didn't include Fayette County. And then in 2020, 2021, it included Fayette County, but it didn't include Jefferson County. So um, we've had to really look at this. Um, and the 2021 kit was given to those students that were in person. So it did not give it to those that were learning virtually. And I wanted you all to know that. So significant changes um, and impact on trend data. Like I said, um, the impact of COVID-19 on our outcomes. We had a new cohort of students because previously we had done it every even year. And so it was the same students that was taking it previously each year. So this year where we've had to push it back and now it's going to be given in the odd number years, uh, this is a new cohort of students. We have many new questions. Uh, we did a reordering of questions so that we could do skip patterns so they wouldn't have to answer all the questions. They answered no to uh, specific questions and it kind of skipped. Um, displaying a trend line, we've got a break in the line because of that um, new cohort of students. So that way you all can see that. Okay. So we're going to start off with our demographics. With race and ethnicity, uh, we had 72.6% that was non-Hispanic white. We had 8.4% that was non-Hispanic black. 8% was Hispanic. 1.3% were non-Hispanic Asian. 2.2% was non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. 1% was non-Hispanic American Indian, Alaska Native. 2.2% was non-Hispanic Other. And 6.4% was non-Hispanic Multiracial. And this was for 2018. And I showed 2018 because I wanted you to see the difference um, in this past year's, in the 2021 data. So for 2021, the non-Hispanic white stayed about the same, 73.7%. We had a little bit of a reduction in the non-Hispanic black down to 6.5%. We had an increase in our Hispanic uh, at 9.1%. And then the previous year it was 8%. Non-Hispanic Asian was 1.4%. Non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander was 0.2%. And non-Hispanic Native Indian, American Indian, Alaska Native is 1%. Non-Hispanic Other, 1.9%. And non-Hispanic Multiracial, 6.2%. So we had a little bit of a change, but I think the thing that we've really got to look at is that we had a uh, raise in the Hispanic population. So gender identity, this was a question that we added. Um, are you, before we did just female, male or other, and now we've got female, male, questioning or unsure, identity not listed here, or prefer not to say. And as you can see, we had 45% female, 49% male, 4% identity not listed here or questioning, and then 
that preferred not to say. And here you can see it broken down by the, um, the grades. The blue is the sixth grade, purple is the eighth grade, red is 10th grade, and the green is the 12th grade. And so, of course, our biggest majority is male or female, um, with male being the predominant. And then when you look down, you can see um, some of the other breakdowns. For sexual orientation, which of the following best describes you? 73% were straight or heterosexual. Gay, lesbian, or identity not listed was 14%. Questioning and unsure was 5% and prefer not to say is 8%. And this is the breakdown by grades, which is the following best describes you. And you can see um, our trends, especially with our sixth graders, you see that um, a lot of times this is they're really not sure, and so they're starting to look at that. And I think that's what our lines are really showing. We have military connection. Who in your family is currently in the military or previously served in the military? And you can mark more than one answer if you have more than one family member in the military. So we had 31.7% that were grandparents or other relatives. We had 7.5%, which was the father, 3.8% that said brother or sister, 3.2% that said other guardian or parent figure, and 1.6% that said mother. The percent of students with at least one family member in or previously in the military, this is the breakdown of the grades. You can see that it's, um, we, we go from 35.3% with 12th grade to 41.3% in the eighth grade. Hearing status, are you hard of hearing, deaf, deaf blind, or none of these? 98% were none of these. Of the ones that were, 1.9% were hard of hearing, 0.1% were deaf, and 0.1% were deaf blind. If you answer deaf, hard of hearing, or deaf blind, how do you prefer to learn the information? 52% prefer to look, see it in spoken or hear it in spoken English, 2% uh, through an interpreter, 7% in large print, 5% in a format compatible with a screen reader. 4% in American Sign Language, and 30% in Written English. And I think this is really important when we're putting together um, information, uh, whether it be webinars or whether it be um, in print, uh, to really look at this and so that we can include everyone. Okay, now we're getting into the substance use. When we look at alcohol use, uh, trends in past 30 day alcohol use, the uh, solid one is alcohol in US 10th graders. And then the dotted line is alcohol for Kentucky 10th graders. And you can see between 2018 and 2021, where the break is. And that's where we start the new cohort of students. You can see that there's a trending line going down 
And that's the way it is in most of our substances. But, um, and we really are proud of the work that our prevention uh, coalitions across the state have really been working hard to get these trend lines to go down. So if you drink, do you primarily get alcohol from, and you can mark all that apply. So we know that 33.2% was from friends, 28% was other, 20.7% was parents, 12.1% was other family, 9.6% was siblings, 5.8% was from buying it from a store. 3.2% was strangers. 1.1% was grocery pickup. And 0.9% was online ordering. And those were some of the things that we added in um, in this world of technology and click it and uh, online ordering, we had to add some of those in. So tobacco, trends in past 30 day tobacco use, US versus Kentucky. The uh, blue lines are gonna be your cigarettes or your combustible cigarettes. And then the green lines are gonna be um, e-cigarettes. The solid lines will be the US 10th graders, and then the dotted lines will be your Kentucky 10th graders. As you can see, our combustible cigarettes have really went down um, with that trend line going down. And then the e-cigarettes, the e we see that it's really uh, took a big jump. Uh, we had a little bit of a decrease and during COVID, I think, had a big part to play in that. But I think with our next iteration, which will be in 2023, we'll see another big jump in e-cigarettes there. And we wanted to note that the question, the wording for e-cigarette question in Kentucky changed in 2021. So the wording for e-cigarette questions varies slightly from the national survey item. So our e-cigarettes, when, if ever, did you first vape or use an electronic vapor product? Of the 40.6% of 12th graders who had reported ever using one, um, you can see that fifth, at 15 years old uh, was 10.2%. 14 years old was 8.8%. 16 years old was 8.3%. And then 17 or older or 12 year old or 13 year old, sorry, was 4.7%. 12 year olds was 1.9%. 10 or younger was 1.1 and 11 was 0.9. So on how many occasions, if any, have you vaped or used an electronic vapor product in the past 12 months? Of students who have vaped, used an electronic vapor product in the past 12 months, as you can see, 39.3% was 40 plus occasions. One to two occasions was 22.1%. Three to five occasions was 12.8%. Six to nine occasions was 8.9%. 10 to 19 occasions was 9.6%. 20 to 39 occasions was 7.3%. But I think what we really have to look at here is that 40 plus occasions, you know, with 39% of the kids using um, either daily or almost daily.
on tobacco e-cigarettes, on how many occasions, if any, have you vaped, used an electronic vapor product in the past 12 months? You can see here the breakdown for 8th through 12th grade or 6th through 12th grade students. 6th grade students in the one to two times um, really have a big number there. And then your 12th graders are for where you're going to see the 40 plus. So the daily or almost daily. During the past 30 days, how did you get your own electronic vapor products? 48.5% borrowed, 36% someone else purchased, 27.3% was from others, 24.2% someone of age gave them, 21.5% they bought at a store, 4.6% stolen, 4.1% bought them on the internet. Okay, on this one we had three questions, three different ones. So the first one was, how wrong do you think it is for someone your age to vape or use cigarettes? The second one is, how wrong do your parents parents feel it would be for you to vape or use cigarette e-cigarettes and how wrong do your friends feel it would be for you to vape or use e-cigarettes as you can see the personal was a lot lower than the parental uh, so the largest group of you think their parents feel it is very wrong at 71.9 percent the largest group of youth feel it is very wrong at 33.1%. And then the largest group of youth think their friends feel it is not wrong at all at 27.9%. If you wanted to get an e-cigarette or vaping product, how easy would it be for you to get one? 35.4% say it's very easy. 24.9% say it's very hard. 16.6% it's sort of hard. And 23.2% sort of easy. And this was our 10th grade representation here. During the past 30 days, which of the following tobacco products did you use on at least one day? And they can mark all that applied. And this is also 10th grade representation. Some other new tobacco product not listed here, 3.2%. Snooze, 1.7%. Roll your own cigarettes, 1.3%. Dissolvable tobacco products, 0.7%. Smoking tobacco from a hookah or water pipe, 6.6%. Pipes filled with tobacco, 0.5%. And vitus at 0.4%. Other drugs. So trends in past 30 day of other drug use in the US versus Kentucky, you'll see that cannabis is in the blue lines. Any prescription drug is in the green lines and then heroin is in the purple lines. Again, the solid lines are for US 10th graders, for cannabis, for Prescription drugs, we have 12th graders represented, and then heroin is 10th graders. And the reason that they did that is because we couldn't get a, um, a good representation or between 10th and 12th graders. They asked the question, 
information on the on the uh, monitoring the future survey of 12th graders for this one. So cannabis, you can see that our numbers are going down um, at 8.2% for Kentucky. For prescription drugs, it has went down to 1.9%. And then heroin use at 0.3%. Cannabis, during the past 30 days, how did you use marijuana? 6.1% sorry, 6 vaped in a dab pen. 5.5% used a joint or blunt. 4.1% use a bowl, pipe, or a bong. 3.1% use it with edibles. 2.1% in waxes or concentrates. 1.7% vaporized. 1.2% some other way. And 0.7% in a drink. And you know, when we're looking at these, we also have to realize that right now in Kentucky, medical, recreational, none of that is legal in Kentucky. But there are places where um, minor offenses, where it's being decriminalized. Jefferson County being one of those places. On how many occasions, if any, have you used hallucinogenic drugs such as LSD, acid, PCP, angel dust, mescaline, or mushrooms? So the blue lines are the past 30 days and the 12 months are the red is the past 12 months. You can see the numbers are small, but they are rising a little bit. Substance use consequences in the past 12 months. Has your drinking and or drug use caused any of the following problems? 6.4% could not recall what they did. 3.5% got into fights with their parents. 3.2% hurt or injured themselves. 3.1% thought they had a drinking or drug problem. 2.8% got into fights verbal or physical with other kids. 2.6% got into trouble at school. 2.1% was pressured by someone to do something sexual. 1.8% committed illegal acts, for example, theft, breaking and entering. 1.5% was hospitalized or had to see a doctor. 1.2% got stopped by the police for drunk driving or disorderly conduct. And 0.9% was involved in a car crash, and 0.4% pressured someone else to do something sexual against their wishes. Now we're going to get into the mental health and suicide pieces. The serious psychological distress, uh, looking at the K6 scale. Brief screening scale for non-specific psychological distress like depression and anxiety in the past 30 days. The percent who scored 13 or higher on the K6 scale. As you can see, this is broken down by grades. So the green is 10th graders. So the 10th graders and 12th graders were at 25.2%. Eighth graders at 21.2%. And then you see the sixth grade uptick at 
been an uptick in all of them, but the sixth graders really um, are the ones that we've really been looking at. Lifetime deliberate self-harm, 10th graders at 19.7%, 12th graders at 18.6%, 8th graders at 17.4%, and then the 6th graders at 13.3%. For suicidality, suicidal ideation in the past year, 10th graders was at 15.9%, 12th graders at 15%, 8th graders at 14.3%, and 6th graders at 9.9%. And you can see that really big uptick with those sixth graders. Suicide plan in the past year uh, for 10th graders, it was 12.9%. For eighth graders, it was 12.1%. For 12th graders, it was 11.2%. And then sixth graders was at 8.1%. Suicide attempts in the past year, eighth graders was at 8.4%, 10th graders was at 8.1%, 12th graders at 6.7%, and then sixth graders were also at 6.7%. And here you can see that um, pretty big uptick there too in the sixth graders. Okay, for student safety, the percent of students who feel unsafe or very unsafe at school, 10th graders, it was at 12.7%, 12th graders was at 11.7%, Eighth graders was at 11.1% and sixth graders were at 8.6%. Trends in the past year for bullying on school property and cyberbullying. Um, this was US versus Kentucky. And we compared those to the Youth Risk and Behavioral Surveillance System, the YRBSS. Um, from 2011 to 2019. So the blue was the 10th graders that were bullied, and then the red is electronically bullied, the 10th graders. And Kentucky, the um, bullied was at 22.1%, and then the electronic bullying was at 16.9%. Percent of students who carried a handgun in the past year. 10th graders was at 12.2%. 8th graders was at 11.8%. 12th graders was at 10%. And 6th graders was at 9.8%. And this was at any time. So it wasn't just at school because we have that next. Percent of students who carried a handgun to school in the past year. 12th graders was at 0.3%. 10th graders was at 0.2%. Eighth graders was at 0.2%. And sixth graders was at 0.2%. Percent of students who carried a handgun in the past year by ethnicity. 
So non-Hispanic Asian was at 3.9%. Non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander was at 5.7%. And this data could be unstable due to a small sample size. Non-Hispanic Black was at 6.6%. Hispanic was at 9.7%. Non-Hispanic Other was at 10.9%. Non-Hispanic White was at 12.9%. Non-Hispanic Multiracial was at 13.8% and non-Hispanic American Indian Alaskan Native was at 21.6%. Now we'll go on to the gambling and gaming. <clears throat> Whoops, sorry, let me go back. Percent of students who have ever gambled or participated in online gaming for money. 12th graders was, or 10th graders was at 14.1%. 12th graders was at 13.8%. 8th graders was at 13.3%. And then sixth graders was at 10%. This is one of those, um, well, we had kept this in here, but um, we added the gaming in there uh, for the online gaming that a lot of kids are doing now. Percent of students who gambled or participated in the online gaming for money in the past year. 12th graders was at 8.4%, 10th graders at 8.3%, 8th graders at 7.5%, and 6th graders at 5.4%. So the per percent of students who gambled or participated in online gaming for many in the past 30 days. 12th graders at 5.5%, 10th graders at 5%, 8th graders at 4.5%, and 6th graders at 3.2%. This was past 30 days. Okay, now we're going to start looking at the impact that COVID had on um, our kids. So on mental health. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, how often was your mental health not good? So poor mental health includes stress, anxiety, and depression. So never was it 29%, rarely was it 17%, sometimes was it 22%, most of the time 21%, and always was it 11%. So percent of students reporting poor mental health most of the time or always during the COVID-19 pandemic. As you can see, 12th grade was at 42%, 10th grade at 38.3%, 8th grade at 31.1%, and 6th grade at 20%. You know, we really look because our 12th graders have really been impacted, I think, the most. I mean, they all have, but 12th graders um, for the past three years. So 
three fourths of their high school years have been impacted by COVID-19. So they've been in and out of school. Um, they haven't been able to do some of the stuff, uh, you know, those momentous times throughout their uh, high school career, uh, some of the dances, you know, sometimes graduation were canceled. Um, so it's really had a big impact on their mental health. So COVID impact on alcohol use. Did you drink more alcohol during the COVID-19 pandemic than before it started? 71% uh, said they did not drink before or during COVID. 22% said no or not sure. And 7% said yes. Percent of students who drank before the COVID-19 pandemic reporting increased alcohol use. 12th grade was at 31.2%. 10th grade at 28.4%, 8th grade at 17.6%, and 6th grade at 7%. So did you vape, smoke cigarettes, or use smokeless tobacco more during the COVID-19 pandemic than before it started? So 72% said, I did not vape, smoke cigarettes, or use smokeless tobacco during or before COVID. 18% said no or not sure, and 10% said yes. The percent of students who vaped, smoked cigarettes, or use smokeless tobacco before the COVID-19 pandemic reporting increased use. 12th graders reported 41.9%, 10th graders at 42%, 8th graders at 36.8%, and 6th graders at 17%. Did you use drugs more during the COVID-19 pandemic than before it started? So you count using marijuana, synthetic marijuana, cocaine, prescription pain medicine without a doctor's prescription and the other illegal drugs. 76% said I did not use drugs during or before COVID. 19% said no or not sure. And 5% said yes. For other drug use, percent of students who use drugs before the COVID-19 pandemic reported increased drug use. So when we say that, it's of the ones who used, these are the ones that reported increased drug use. 12th grade was 32.8%. 10th grade was 28.2%. Eighth grade was 17.3%. Sixth grade was 5.2%. Now we're going to go to race based experiences and concerns. And a lot of these were new questions that were added, or some of them were. During the past year, have you been fearful for your safety because of your race or culture? Non-Hispanic Black reported 38%. Non-Hispanic Asian reported 32.5%. Non-Hispanic Multiracial, 23.6%. Non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, reported 21.5%, Hispanic reported 19.8%, non-Hispanic other 
was 17.2%. Non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Native reported 10.5%. And then non-Hispanic White reported 4.1%. During the past year, have you been worried you could be treated differently because of your race? Non-Hispanic Black reported 46.2%. Non-Hispanic Asian reported 41.8%. Non-Hispanic Multiracial was at 29.4%. Non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander reported 27.9%. Hispanic reported 27.9%. Non-Hispanic other at 22%. Non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Native at 12.3%. And non-Hispanic white at 4.9%. And I think you really have to look at this because um, we have really seen a big difference in this because of um, the Breonna Taylor case um, and all the other cases across the United States, but especially because the Breonna Taylor case uh, happened in Louisville. Uh, so it was close to home. During the past year, have your friends or family been treated differently because of their race? 29.9% of non-Hispanic Black, non-Hispanic Asian reported 25.9%, non-Hispanic multiracial reported 25.5%. Hispanic at 24.9%. Non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander at 24.4%. Non-Hispanic Other at 19.3%. Non-Hispanic American Indian Alaska Native at 12.2%. And non-Hispanic White at 8.9%. Okay, during the past year, I've experienced stress because I worry I will be a target of racism. So 32% of native, of non-Hispanic Blacks, 27.7% of non-Hispanic Asians, 19.6% of non-Hispanic multiracial, 17.2% of non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander. <laughs> 16.9% of Hispanic. 13.3% of non-Hispanic other. 8.7% of non-Hispanic American Indian Alaska Native and 3% of non-Hispanic white had reported uh, that they experienced stress because they worried about being a target of racism. Sorry about that. You can tell it is fall in Kentucky. Okay, so during the past year, I experienced fear for my friends or family's safety because of my race or culture. Non-Hispanic Black reported 31.4%, non-Hispanic Asian 25.5%, non-Hispanic Native 
non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander at 24.2%, non-Hispanic multiracial at 22.3%, Hispanic at 20.3%, non-Hispanic other at 15.2%, non-Hispanic American Indian Alaska Native at 11.6%, and non-Hispanic white at 6.3%. During the past year, I've been treated differently because of my race. Non-Hispanic black at 30.8%, non-Hispanic Asian at 28.8%, non-Hispanic multiracial at 23.7%, non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander at 21.3%, Hispanic at 21%, non-Hispanic other at 16.5%, non-Hispanic Alaskan Indian, or American Indian Alaskan Native at 9.9%, and non-Hispanic white at 4.3%. Then it goes to my friends or loved ones have been targets of racism. Non-Hispanic Black at 26.8. Non-Hispanic Multiracial at 25.25, at 25.2%. Non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander at 22.7%. Hispanic at 20.7% non-Hispanic Asian at 18.9, non-Hispanic other at 16.8, non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Native at 11.5%, and non-Hispanic white at 11.1%. And then during the past year, I have been a target of racism non-Hispanic Black at 24.5%, non-Hispanic Asian at 22.5%, non-Hispanic Multiracial at 19%, non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander at 18%, Hispanic at 15.7%, non-Hispanic Other at 11.8%, non-Hispanic Alaskan, American Indian, Alaska Native at 7.6%, non-Hispanic white at 2.8%. And then during the past year, I have never personally experienced racism. Non-Hispanic white at 31.2%, non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander at 27.3%, non-Hispanic multiracial at 27%, non-Hispanic black at 26.1%, non-Hispanic Asian at 23.5%, Hispanic at 22.8%, non-Hispanic other at 22.4%, and non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Native at 17.5%. So when we look at the trends in race-based experiences and concerns, we know that <clears throat> non-Hispanic Black followed by non-Hispanic Asian and non-Hispanic multiracial students had the highest percentage of students in the past year who worried they could be treated differently because of their race, reported their friends or family had been treated differently because of their race, experienced stress because they worried they would get a, would be a target of racism. They reported being treated differently because of their race and reported being a target of racism. <clears throat> Non-Hispanic Black followed by non-Hispanic Asian and non-Hispanic 
Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander students had the highest percentage of students in the past year who reported fear for their friends or family's safety because of their race or culture and reported their friends or loved ones had been targets of racism. So those are really good. I mean, these are things that we really need to look at um, as we go forward. Okay, so racial justice movement. <clears throat> Have you ever experienced anger from the recent events of the racial justice movement? And you can see here, um, it kind of follows the trend, like what the, um, the racism trends did. <clears throat> Non-Hispanic Black at 51. 52.1%, non-Hispanic multiracial at 45.3%, non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander at 44.3%, non-Hispanic other at 39.5%, Hispanic at 38.7%, non-Hispanic Asian at 37.6%, Non-Hispanic American Indian, Alaska Native at 32.7%, and non-Hispanic White at 31.8%. Have you been stressed from the recent events of the racial justice movement? <clears throat> and this follows along again. So non-Hispanic Black at 44.3%. Non-Hispanic multiracial at 42.5%. Non-Hispanic other, 39.1%. Non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander at 37.2%. Hispanic at 35.8%. Non-Hispanic American Indian Alaskan Native at 32.8%. Non-Hispanic Asian at 32% and non-Hispanic White at 28.1%. <clears throat> Have you been anxious from the recent events of the racial justice movement? So non-Hispanic multiracial reported 40.1%. Non-Hispanic Black reported 39.5%, non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander at 36.2%, non-Hispanic Other at 33.1%, non-Hispanic Asian at 32.7%, Hispanic at 32.2%, non-Hispanic American Indian Alaskan Native at 27.9%, and non-Hispanic white at 25.9%. Have you been scared from the recent events of racial, racial justice movement? So non-Hispanic black reported 37%, non-Hispanic multiracial at 31%, non-Hispanic native Hawaiian Pacific Islander at 27.9%, non-Hispanic other at 27.9%, Hispanic at 26.4%, non-Hispanic Asian at 25.4%, non-Hispanic American Indian Alaska Native at 21.2%, and non-Hispanic white at 18.6%. Okay, have you been confused from the recent events of the racial justice movement? Non-Hispanic Black reported 47%, non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander at 44.9%, non-Hispanic Other at 44.5%, non-Hispanic Multiracial at 43.6%, 
Hispanic at 38.2%, non-Hispanic American Indian Alaska Native at 37.1%, non-Hispanic Asian at 35.2%, non-Hispanic White at 33.6%. Hang in with me, just a couple more slides. We have this and then we'll do a, another trend. Have you been empowered or energized from the recent events of the racial justice movement? So non-Hispanic Black reported 29.5%. Non-Hispanic Multiracial at 25%. Non-Hispanic Asian at 21.4%, Hispanic at 21.1%, non-Hispanic Other at 20.9%, non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander at 19.5%, non-Hispanic American Indian Alaska Native at 18%, and non-Hispanic White at 15.5%. Have you felt depressed from the recent events of the racial justice movement? Non-Hispanic multiracial reported 23.2%, non-Hispanic black at 22.5%, non-Hispanic other at 20.9%, non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander at 20.3%, non-Hispanic American Indian Alaska Native at 19.8%, Hispanic at 18.8%, non-Hispanic Asian at 15.4%, and non-Hispanic White at 12.7%. Have you felt guilty from the recent events of the racial justice movement? Non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander at 17, reported 17.3%. Non-Hispanic Other reported 13.5%. Hispanic reported 13.1%. Non-Hispanic Multiracial reported 13%. Non-Hispanic Black at 12.2%. Non-Hispanic American Indian Alaska Native at 11.7%, non-Hispanic White at 10.5%, non-Hispanic Asian at 10.3%. <clears throat> so the racial justice movement trends <clears throat> from the recent events of the racial, racial justice movement, we found that non-Hispanic Black non-Hispanic multiracial, non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, and non-Hispanic other students were most likely to report experiencing stress, anxiety, fear, confusion, and depression. Non-Hispanic Black, non-Hispanic multiracial, non-Hispanic Asian, and Hispanic students were most likely to report being empowered or energized. And then non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, non-Hispanic other, non-Hispanic -his and non-Hispanic multiracial students were most likely to report experiencing guilt. Okay, so other student characteristics. And these were some of the, there were some of these that were new questions. So grades during the past 12 months, how would you describe your grades in school? 48.4% said mostly A's, 29.9% mostly B's, 14.1% mostly C's, 3.9% mostly D's, 
3% mostly Fs and 0.7% my school does not use this system. On average night, how many hours of sleep do you get? And you can see the 6th, 8th, 10th, 12th grade. Uh, for the most part, it looks like it's about six to seven hours. Um, sixth grade, 40, 44, 54% uh, got eight to nine or 10 hours or more. Um, of eighth graders, 37%, 10th graders, 25%. And 12th grader, 19%. Extracurricular activities, on average, how many hours during a typical week do you participate in? <clears throat> so, school based extracurricular activities, we see that. from one to 20 plus hours is 4, 53%. Um, for community activities is 21%. Faith-based activities is 35%. And we know when we're looking at risk and protective factors that being connected is one of those protective factors. And that's why we wanted to look at this to see uh, how many kids were being connected to school-based extracurricular activities, community activities, and faith activities. Social media. How often do you check social media like Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok, Facebook, or online gaming platforms? So 24.5% said every couple of minutes, 29.1% about every 10 to 15 minutes, 25.2% once or twice an hour, and 21.2% said a few times a day. So how does social media usually make you feel? And I thought this was very interesting. So 5.3%, I don't use social media. 26.8%, usually better. 2.6%, usually worse. 38.4%, sometimes better and sometimes worse. And 26.9%, doesn't make me feel better or worse. A trusted adult, do you know an adult in or out of school with whom you could talk or go to help for, to go to for help? So 86.3% said yes, but there was 13.7% said no. And we know that that's another one of those protective factors is having a trusted adult that they can go to. Okay, so what can you do? Um, one of the biggest things is to become involved yourself, whether it's with coalitions, church youth groups, community programs and events, um, just making sure that you become involved and be a part of the solution. Now, how can you use what we've talked about today in your work? First, show you that you care or show people that you care. I think that's one of the biggest things. Uh, we know that relationships are probably the biggest piece of why people are successful. Um, and so making those relationships with other adults, with um, people you work with, people in your community, um, and then with the youth, making those connections with those youth, 
showing them that you care. The next one is to show up. Uh, when you say you're going to be somewhere, you know, unless something really comes up, show up because they need to know that they can count on you. Help youth become involved. You know, help them be part of the solution. Um, I think that is really a big piece of it is, you know, we, we say that kids, once they graduate from high school and go off to college, then they stay gone. Well, give them a reason to come back. Give them a reason to work, play, or live in your area. Um, you know, they have to be proud of where they come from and really want to be a part of making it better. Uh, so help empower those youth um, and be part of the solution. Okay, so... Next, we are going to take questions. Here's my contact information. I know that was a lot of information, a lot of statistics, but if there's any way that I can help you out um, and answer, you know, any questions uh, offline or anything, let me know. <clears throat> Lee, is there any questions that we can answer? Yes, we have several. And I just wanted to say we need to show Shelly some love for being <laughs> able to make it through all of those slides while dealing with Kentucky um, issues. So I'm going to start with the ones in Q&A, but we also have a few in the chat box too. And you are getting some love for your efforts, Shelly. So first question. What prompted the change in wording for e-cigarettes and what is the new wording? Um, that's a good question. <clears throat> I think what it was, was we looked at um, some of the things that we had heard from some of our focus groups, from some of our coalitions and what was happening without, within the regions and we wanted to tighten up our wording. Um, specifically, I can't tell you for sure what it says right now, but um, if you give me your name and address, I can get it to you. Did you hear that Juanita Shackelford? Okay, next question. What was the reasoning or intent behind the question on military background of family members? Um, we've had a lot of, um, well, of course, we've had a lot of military connected youth within our state. And we wanted to see if those military youth that we were seeing uh, trends with them and substance use and mental health and suicide. Um, and so that's why we added that question in. And it has really helped us drive some of the work that we're doing in Kentucky uh, with the Purple Star program uh, and things like that. So um, there's a lot more um, intentional work with military connected youth. And if you missed our last learning series session, it was on the Purple Star program and military connected youth. So earlier I dropped um, a link. I may have dropped it in q and I'll drop it in the chat box in just a minute, but you can go back and watch the recording of that. And Next Steve, question. Cam Steve yes. Cameron and Sarah Jemison are uh, great to work with. Uh, just reach out to them and they can get you connected. Okay, next question is, will the parents have access to this information? So they do not have access to the individual students' information. Uh, they can get regional and state data on the KIPP survey website. Um, and then sometimes we have individual uh, school district data if they give us permission to share it. 
uh, but sometimes they don't give us permission to share it. But we do have regional and state data that they can see. I dropped that link in the chat box for the KIPP survey. Before we go to the next question, do you want to talk a little bit about that website and what you can access there? Yes. Um, on the KIPP website, KIPP survey website, you will find regional and state data. Uh, they have reports in there for both of those. It also gives you the contact information for Lisa Crabtree or Meredith Cahill, who are the ones that are working on the KIPP survey. And if you have specific questions about how a question is put together or why they did one thing or instead of another, uh, you can always reach out to them. They are very good to get back pretty quickly. Um, and that website is, has a lot of information on it. Gives you background information about the KIPP survey. Okay, I use that um, website a lot and provide it to others a lot. It's a great, it's a great resource. Was the carrying handguns to school in the past year national data? I believe the high percentage of Alaskan Native may be because they are allowed to carry guns to school to protect themselves, not from other people. Yes, I think that has a lot to do with it. And um, that actually was uh, Kentucky data was what it was. Um, it wasn't national survey data. But I think that culture had a lot, has a lot to do with it. And it does for uh, Appalachia too, uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, Appalachian students, a lot of, well, let me say, Kentucky students, especially rural Kentucky students, are uh, taught to use um, hand, use guns early in life, and they hunt a lot. So that culture, I think, uh, builds part of that too. So after collecting the data you reported, what is the threshold amount for next steps action to address the areas of concern? That's a good question. Yeah, it is. Um, and right now, each of the 14 regional prevention centers across the state are in the process of doing a needs assessment and using this data to drive their prevention work. Um, we also, I know also that other um, entities within the state use this data to drive their work. Um, so. Um, and, and of course, at the state level, we do too. Um, we really use it to look at where we want to focus in on. Same for the regional interagency councils when you're talking about other entities in the state. Um, a lot of information about the regional interagency councils can be found on the Department for Behavioral Health website, and I'll drop that in the chat in a moment too. Did you compare the race-based experiences and concerns to previous years? If the Breonna Taylor incident impacts the 2021 data, you should see the difference in prior year data. We did in some, but we didn't have as many questions on it prior to 2021 as what we, you know. So I think we really had to watch um, how we're looking at that data um, to see. And I think we, we can do it in, in some areas, um, but like I said, there wasn't as many questions as what there was on the 2021. I am, from the last question, I'm dropping the website in here for the, for the REACTS, the Regional Interagency Councils. And now the next question. Which institutions are best equipped to address data received from the racial justice movement? How can this data drive the development of strategies? Okay, say that again. Which institutions are best equipped to address data received from the racial justice movement? And then the follow-up is how can this data drive the development of strategies? Well, I know that um, at the state level, we have really been looking across the board at um, this data 
um, as far as other entities, um, we're actually looking for other entities to work with us on this um, so that we can really focus in on it and, and really to take in the movement because we have kids who are really interested in this and we want them to become involved. So how can we do that? So I know that probably didn't answer your question um, as well as you like, but um, we're working on it at the state level. As far as other entities, um, we're looking for others to work with. Mm -hmm. And there was a question in the chat that, or a comment, it says, it would be great if this data was broken down by race. Is the raw data available? Is that available on the KIPP survey website? Um, I'm not sure if the raw data are, is available on the KIPP website, but if not, you can talk, you can ask uh, Lisa Crabtree. And it depends on how you want that data. You, we can get aggregated data, um, but uh, you can check with. Uh, either Lisa or Meredith on that. And that sometimes they will pull those reports for you. Uh, sometimes there's a nominal fee of about $50. Sometimes it's a little bit more, um, but you can check with them and see. I was thinking I missed one in the chat. I'm gonna go back to the Q&A. Is this information also available by counties? It is. But I will say this, the aggregate data that you see is um, by region or state. The county data, again, is one of those things. For instance, Boyd County has, what, 16 school districts, 13 or 16 school districts. And so you could probably get an aggregated one for there. But if you go to Carter County, they have one school district and they may or may not uh, give you that permission uh, to use that data. And I have a comment from a fellow Department for Behavioral Health, Developmental and Intellectual Disabilities staff that says we are working on having data available by race in a way that prevents misinterpretation. Yes. Um, I want to confirm that we cannot use the KIPP data results on our websites without approval. And who would we get this from as a step as substance abuse is one of our goals objectives. So you can check with Lisa Crabtree and she can tell you whether there is permission. And then if not, it has to be the superintendent of the school district that gives you that permission. I believe that we may have some reach staff on this webinar and if so if you could drop um her contact information in the chat that would be great i was actually asking one of the reach folks to do it so you didn't have to shelly but at the end we may need to do that that's fine okay i was wondering if you could take the question or if you're typing is the serious psychological distress data self-reported by students it is self-reported by students, yes. And we have another question about um, how are race-based issues being addressed? And I think, it, you know, that's, it's different. Um, we, I think at the department, we have really started looking at how uh, we can put that into our programs, how to work with our programs. First, we've had to do a lot of education. Um, and I think we had to be educated first on specific things before we can educate our programs. Mm -hmm. I think now we are getting to the point where we can educate our programs and how they can go about uh, doing those things. And our department has a racial equity plan and we welcome partners to address these concerns. So um, 
I'll put another email address in the chat box if you are interested in talking to one of our um, team members on our racial equity team. And that is Michelle Niehaus. And I just put her email address in the chat. Um, I want to make sure I didn't miss. We had, we had another comment. Is that to say that this data set is not available to the public? Transparency is key. It is. Um, when we get ready to do the survey, um, there is a checkbox that the KIPP survey administrator um, it has to be checked by the superintendent that it is um, easy that we can, you know, share the data. But um, sometimes they don't, um, and it has to be. It you know it's one of those things. Kentucky is a um, opt-in state, no, opt-out. Um, and then we have at least one uh, district that is an opt-in district. Uh, some of our bigger uh, urban areas are, they have to opt-in to take the surveys. Um, now, sometimes it's just a matter of the right person having a conversation with the superintendents. Um, and then other times they want a open records request. Is there anything that can be done with any of our folks in the room to um, any advocacy for the KIPP survey that they can do? Oh, it is. Yes. Um, we are in the process of talking to our school districts about taking the KIPP survey in 20 in the fall of 2023 so it would be wonderful if you could talk to your school districts about participating in it and also talking to those school superintendents or school board members about um, them releasing that information because if any if you want talking points, you can probably contact Shelly and she can assist with that. Absolutely. Oh, and one more question in the Q&A box. Do we have to get permission to report the aggregate data or is that for county specific data? We took yeah. ag aggregate regional data and reported some indicators in our community health assess assessment data. Is that allowed? Yes, it is allowed. So regional and stat dat, state data are aggregated enough to where uh, you don't have to have permission. You can use that um, at any time. It's the county and district level data that there has to be permissions. And am I correct that that is to protect the student's identity? It is. Okay, if anybody has any more questions, you have... Um... Just another minute to enter them in the Q&A box or the chat box. And I just want to say thank you so much, Shelly, for this presentation. It is a lot of data. We had some comments that, wow, that was a lot. Um, it is, but it's great information. And I encourage you um, to go check out the KIPP survey website when you can. And you're getting lots of kudos in the chat box, Shelly. So thank you again. And, and let me say that if you ever have questions um, about breaking it down so that there's or there's specific things that you'd like to see, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, I'll be more than happy to help you in any way that I can or get you connected to somebody who can. Thank you, Shelly. And for those still on, let me just quick reminder that you will not get an email with a session evaluation today. That will be in the coming weeks. And be sure to register for all of our learning series events um, using the same email address. And I'm going to drop that in the chat box in case you have not received it by email. And feel free to contact me. Um, 
if you would like to be added to our distribution list in case you were forwarded this from a coworker. So thank you very much. Thank you for our, to our presenter, our um, interpreters, and to our captioner as well.